All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our VCBA practice exam series. We'll be going through another set of questions together and break them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. You are reviewing daily progress with one of your behavior technicians. The technician reports the client was non-compliant in class all day, which caused several issues. You ask them to provide an operational definition of non-compliant behavior. Which of the following responses best meets the requirement for an operational definition? When we talk about operational definitions, we want definitions that are clear, complete, and concise. So we want to deliver and convey as much information as possible in a clear way that is not too wordy and long because we want these definitions easy to understand and easy to replicate. So if we need an operational definition of non-compliant behavior, what are we going to go with? A, non-compliant behavior includes any actions that go against the teacher's instructions. That's pretty vague. What are any actions that are going against the teacher's instructions? Can we do better and define it more objectively? B, non-compliant behavior means the client refused to follow directions and ignored requests during lessons. It's a little better, but it's still going to be pretty subjective about what it means to ignore and refuse and what counts as directions and what don't. C, non-compliant behavior refers to any negative behavior that disrupts the flow of the classroom. Now we're painting with a very broad brush, brush and it's going to be very difficult to pinpoint exactly what we're measuring. So D, non-compliant behavior involves not completing assigned tasks, which is measurable, verbally refusing to follow instructions, much more measurable. We can see the verbal refusal and leaving the designated area without permission. D still isn't perfect, but it's much more observable, much more measurable than any of the other three. So our answer here is going to be D. Luke played in the grass all day yesterday and came home covered in bug bites. He was itching all over his body, so he put some anti-itch cream on his bites. The itching went away, and Luke stopped itching his body, but applied more anti-itch cream later. What changed Luke's behavior? Well, let's think about Luke's behavior. We know he's covered in bug bites, so he starts itching all over, which is the antecedent. He then puts anti-itch cream on bites, which is the behavior, and it takes the itching away. This causes Luke to put more anti-itch cream later. So Luke's behavior has increased, meaning his behavior was definitely reinforced. Now, was the consequence the addition or removal of a stimulus? Well, the consequence was the removal of the itching. So what changed Luke's behavior? A, positive reinforcement. Well, no, because the consequence didn't add a stimulus, it took it away, making it B, negative reinforcement. It can't be C or D because the behavior increased. It didn't decrease. And punishment decreases while reinforcement increases. What changed Luke's behavior? B, negative reinforcement. Amanda walks by someone holding a drink and says, that looks good. What is it? The person tells Amanda it's called a honey deuce. Later, Amanda's friend asks her to grab them a honey deuce, so Amanda does. What does this most closely resemble? So this is a stimulus equivalence question. What kind of stimulus equivalence is represented here? We have a situation where Amanda is holding a drink. Let's call that A. The friend, after Amanda said, or the Amanda is walking by someone holding a drink, A. Amanda says, what is that? The person says, honey deuce, B. So A equals B. Later, Amanda's friend says, grab me a honey deuce, B. So Amanda does. She grabs a drink, A. So Amanda learned that A equals B and then was able to associate that B equals A later on. So what does it resemble? A, reflexivity. Reflexivity is identical matching to sample. So that would be A equals A. Stimulus equivalence needs transitivity. So that is out. We don't have transitivity. C, identical matching to sample is related to reflexivity. So that leaves us with leaves us with, with D, symmetry. A equals B, therefore B equals A. 
Discrete trial training is used to teach someone to discriminate between household items and objects. After several sessions, the person is able to name any object shown to them in the training kitchen. Now the person wants to focus on generalization of their skills. Which modification could be made to the DTT procedure in order to help promote generalization? This is a question on generalization using DTT, which can be very difficult because discrete trial teaching is typically controlled in a, in a similar setting where questions and SDs are given rapidly as are consequences. But we want to make a modification to improve generalization. And the, the target is discriminating between household items and objects. So after several sessions, the person can do it in the training kitchen. How can we generalize that? How can we take it from the training kitchen to somewhere else? How can we generalize these skills using DTT? A, increase the number of trials during each DTT session. Well, if we're still in the training kitchen and we're not changing anything, that's not going to target generalization. That's, going just, that's just going to lead to more practice. B, extend the duration between trials to encourage independent thinking. That's not going to target generalization either. C, fade reinforcements to social reinforcers like praise. Well, we could start to fade out reinforcement and hopefully start to maintain the behavior. But if we want to generalize this behavior, what are we going to have to do? Well, we're going to have to do D, implement the DTT procedure in the person's own personal kitchen. So we need to take it out of this training kitchen into the personal kitchen in order to promote generalization. A researcher is evaluating the effectiveness of a new time management training program designed to improve the organizational skills of high school students over the course of an academic year. The study involves a single group of students who received the training at the beginning of the year, and their organizational skills are assessed at three intervals, before the intervention, immediately after, and at the end of the school year. By the end of the year, students show significant improvement in organizational skills, but it is unclear whether the improvement was solely due to the training program or other factors. Which threat to internal validity is most likely influencing the study's results? Long question, wordy question, not overly difficult if we know our threats to internal validity. The threat to internal validity is threatening our functional relationship between our intervention and the behavior. In this case, we have a researcher who's looking at a time management program over a full year. And so we start training at the beginning of the year and go to the end of the school year. Well, what's going to happen to these students over the course of the year? Well, they're going to mature, right? They're going to grow up and develop naturally. So with these type of time periods, what can really influence the results? A, history. The difference between history and maturation, maturation is history is much more related to the past of the participants not necessarily their current growth. Instrumentation has to do with how we're measuring and taking data. It's not what we're worried about here. We're worried about maturation over this whole academic year and what that might mean for each participant. And then experimental bias. There is no indication that the researcher has bias. The issue becomes we're going through a full year of research, which means a lot of growth, a lot of personal maturation of each student. So what is likely influencing the results? C, maturation. A behavior analyst is developing an intervention plan to increase the number of times a student with ADHD looks at the teacher during social studies class. Primary goal is to enhance the student's active participation while minimizing impulsive responses. To effectively monitor progress toward this goal, which measurement methods should the behavior analyst select? So it's a measurement selection question. And we want to pick a measurement that's going to help us achieve our goal while tracking the behavior the best. The plan is to increase the number of times, so immediately that should jump out at you. When we're focused on the number of times or the amount, we're counting something, right? How many times a student looks at the teacher during social studies class? That's what we're worried about. So if we need to know the number of times, what do we want to use? A, duration. Duration is going to give us a length of time not how many. The duration might not be the best to, to monitor or increase number of times a student looks at the teacher. B, latency. 
Same with latency. Latency is going to give us time in between the SD and the response. We need to know how often they're looking at the teacher. What we'll, what we'll likely use is frequency. We're just going to count. If we want to increase how often a student looks at the teacher, we need to know how often they currently look at the teacher. We need to count that number. And then the whole interval, with whole interval, it is going to give us a frequency count of sorts, but if we're going to pick the best method, we need to pick a continuous method, which is going to be frequency. Jessica wants to evaluate the effects of a video modeling intervention on novel play skills using a telehealth program. Several of Jessica's participants have time constraints, which may not allow them to be seen multiple times per week, but Jessica would still like to collect some baseline data on each participant. What design would be most appropriate if it was unlikely that baseline data were to change dramatically at any point? The key here, a couple keys. First, it's unlikely baseline data are going to change. So if we're taking baseline for an extended period of time, it's very unlikely it's going to be changing or variable. Second, Jessica's participants have time constraints, so she might not be able to see them many times per week. Now, if she's got all these different participants and she wants to evaluate this intervention, but she might not be able to take consistent baseline data, what might we use? Well, let's think about this model where we have a baseline and then we implement an intervention. And then we have a baseline and a break and a baseline and a break. What do we call this? Well, this is a multiple probe design where we don't have to take continuous baseline. So if Jessica is struggling with the fact that her participants cannot be seen multiple times per week, the best option is going to be a multiple probe design. We have A and B, concurrent and non-concurrent multiple baseline design, but even with the multiple baseline, you've got to take continuous baseline data. A changing criterion design, she's teaching play skills. Changing criterion design, you have to ha already have the skill in your repertoire. So the best option here is going to be multiple probe. It's going to give Jessica the best ability to meet the needs of her program and clients. Chad is trying to get some of his work done, but he keeps reaching for his phone, which leads him to scrolling for several minutes at a time. Chad decides he is going to quickly recognize when he starts to reach for his phone and then stop himself as quickly as possible. He is then going to immediately go back to work. What strategy is Chad using? So we have a self-management question. How do we know that? Well, Chad is delivering this intervention himself, managing himself. And what is Chad doing? What do we know? He, we know he keeps reaching for his phone and scrolling. So to stop this, he's going to recognize when he reaches and then not reach. He's cutting off the behavior chain before it happens. What do we call our self-management technique that involves recognizing the beginning of a behavior change chain and stopping it before it goes any further and then doing something else? A, mass practice. Mass practice has to do with an overcorrection procedure, which Chad is not using. Self-evaluation. Chad is not comparing his behavior to any sort of criterion or norm. He's just looking at this behavior chain and trying to stop it. C, positive practice overcorrection. We're not, we know we're not using overcorrection here, right? Chad is simply engaging in habit reversal. He sees the behavior chain starting, and he tries to stop it as quickly as possible, and he tries to do something else. because He's acknowledged that once the chain starts, it leads to behaviors that he no longer wants to see. You're implementing an intervention to help a child independently request a preferred snack without relying on prompts. Initially, whenever the child attempts to request the snack, you provide a verbal prompt immediately. To encourage independence, you decide to use a progressive time delay procedure. How should you modify your prompting strategy to effectively apply progressive time delay? Well, pretty easy question if we know what a progressive time delay is, right? And when we have a time delay prompt, we are waiting in between the SD and the prompt, right? We're giving time for the person to respond. With the progressive time delay, we're giving more and more time, right? So let's look at A, fade in the prompts until the child starts to independently make requests at a higher rate. A doesn't address the progressive time delay that we want to use. A is out. 
B, gradually extend the duration between the request and the prompt. Yes, maybe we start at one second between request and prompt, and then we go two seconds between request and prompt, and then maybe three seconds, right? Progressively increasing the time delay. C, always read all of your answer choices. Switch from verbal prompts to no prompts and take data on the effects for at least three sessions, not addressing our progressive time delay. And D, when the child makes a request, have them wait longer and longer periods of time before you provide the snack. Well, now you're just messing with the contiguity, the closeness of the consequence, which normally is not a great idea. And it's also not a prompt progressive time delay. The progressive time delay gradually extend the duration between that request and that prompt. Novak is searching online for a tennis ball machine that he can use to practice when he doesn't have anyone to play with. Novak is looking at the different specifications of each machine and is especially interested in the amount of time that it takes the machine to shoot the next ball after the previous ball had been launched. What is Novak interested in here relative to the measurement? All right, very applied question. Let's apply our measurement knowledge to what Novak is doing. Novak wants to know about these machines. He wants to know the time it takes the machine to shoot the next ball after the previous ball. So let's say turning on the machine is the SD, and then the first ball is launched, which is our response one. This is gonna be our latency. And then in between each ball is gonna be what? It's gonna be our enter response time. Because time in between responses is enter response times. Time in between each ball is gonna be that enter response time. So what is Novak interested in? Is he interested in rate? Is he interested in some sort of frequency? No, he needs to know time in between. Latency, again, is the time from, let's say, the machine is turned on to the first ball, but not necessarily time in between balls. See duration. Duration is going to measure just an instance of one of the responses, not necessarily time in between. And so what we're looking for here is D, enter response time, time in between balls being shot. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.